Hi, I'm Mark Kaparaskis with Xamarin University, and this is Android 450 Building a Java Bindings Library. Note that this course covers how things work, all the core concepts, and, and how things work when everything goes right. It does not cover how to do customization nor debugging with a binding. So we'll start with a definition and then talk about what libraries are eligible to have binding libraries created for them. And then we'll do some binding first with a Java archive file and then with an Android archive file. After that, we will discuss jar files that use other jar files. So you might have a, an input jar that has a dependency on another jar. And so we'll talk about how to handle that. And there's two cases to see there. And finally, we'll do a survey of several of the most common Java language constructs and see how they get mapped to C Sharp when bindings are created. So first, just what is a bindings library? And once we have that out of the way, we'll talk about which libraries are eligible. For, for motivation for this whole thing, uh, Android's pretty popular these days, and there are a lot of libraries out there that you might want to use in your Xamarin Android application. And a lot of those libraries, of course, are written in Java and packaged as Java Archive or Android Archive files. So the goal here is to let you call those services from C Sharp code in your Xamarin Android app. There's two ways you can do this actually. You could use the Java native interface, JNI, or you could build a bindings library. And, and there's trade-offs to each of these cases. Uh, JNI is a little quicker to get up and running because you don't have to do the initial step of building the library, but the code is a little bit more tedious to write. So if you're doing a lot of work with your JAR or AAR file, then then spending some time up front to create a bindings library is probably worthwhile. Here's an example of JNI. At the top, I have some Java code, my class that contains my method. And then at the bottom, there's six lines of JNI code that I could use to call that Java code from C Sharp. And, and then certainly it's possible to, to compress that JNI code a little bit. Um, I, I wrote it out step by step so it would be a little bit more intuitive, but in general, it's quite tedious to write JNI code, and instead, a bindings library simplifies your client code. So if you take the time to build a bindings library, then your client code looks like the lower box here on the screen. Behind the scenes, the bindings libraries use JNI. The cool thing is, you don't have to write the JNI code. You can create bindings libraries for any JAR file or Android archive file that was originally targeted to be used with Android. That's the case that Xamarin is targeting with their tooling. Now, it might work if you find a jar file out there that wasn't originally targeted Android. However, that's not an officially supported scenario. And here's a short quiz. True or false, you can create bindings libraries for both Java Archive and Android Archive files. That's true, it works for both. And true or false, you can create bindings libraries for any Java library. And based on what we discussed, the, the most appropriate answer is false. The, the Xamarin tooling targets the, the specific case where you have a jar file that was originally targeted to be used with native Android apps. So in this first part, we just set things up. We discussed what a bindings library is, talked just briefly about how it's implemented, and then the limitations, like what types of jar files the um, Xamarin tooling works with. Now we'll see how to bind a jar file. So there's two parts. There's first creating the bindings library, and then using the bindings library in your Xamarin Android application. This is a formal definition for a jar file. So inside a jar file, you're going to have the compiled Java code. So you'll have .class files in the Java bytecode format. And then you'll have perhaps some image and text files, which the Java community calls resources. But, but please note, we're not talking about Android resources here. These are just Java you know, images, text files embedded in the jar file. 
There's also uh, likely to be a manifest inside. And again, this is the Java manifest. This is not the Android manifest. So our goal in creating a bindings library here is to get access to the class files. We want to use the services available in this jar file inside our Xamarin Android app. So to do that, we're gonna create a, what's called a bindings library. And inside the bindings library are going to be managed callable wrappers. And that's just the formal name for the C sharp code that you use in your Xamarin Android app that then forwards your calls through JNI to the underlying jar file. So for example, here in the original Java code, I have a class called contact with a method inside it. And then the Xamarin tooling is going to generate this class over here on the right, the C sharp contact class with the matching method inside it. Our code is gonna call the C sharp get phone number method. And then inside here, the implementation is gonna use JNI to forward the call over to the original Java. Xamarin tooling does a lot of this work for you. You feed your original jar file into the tooling and we build for you a DLL here, a bindings library that contains all those managed callable wrappers. So, so the callable wrappers get generated as part of the build process and then packaged into a DLL that you can use in your Xamarin Android app. You can have multiple jar files as input and they can all get wrapped up into a single bindings library. So here we have managed callable wrappers for everything in this jar file and everything in this jar file. Those first couple of images I showed had the jar file embedded inside the bindings library. And, and that's by far the most common case. It's also the simplest case because you have the jar file in your bindings library. You use that bindings library in your Xamarin Android app. It gets fed through the entire tool chain. For example, the jar file in bytecode, Java bytecode format gets compiled into Dalvik bytecodes and then the resulting bytecodes get embedded in your APK. And, and so that's a really simple way to do things. If you choose to keep the jar file separate from the bindings library, then it's up to you to make sure that that jar file is available at runtime on the device. So the way you control this is with the build action. On the left hand side here, I have embedded jar, and I'd say that's probably the most common one. And then there's input jar, which keeps it separate. And again, it's your responsibility to package that jar file and make sure it's available on the device. And like I said, embedding is probably the most common practice because it is simpler. Create a bindings library. You're mostly gonna be working with the tooling. So you're gonna create a project, put your files into the project, work with the settings for a little bit, and then click on build. There's a template for this a project template. It's called Android Java Bindings Library. And it's available in both Xamarin Studio and Visual Studio. The template includes a folder named jars and you need to add your jar files into that folder. Then for each one of your jar files, you should check the build action. Embedded jar is gonna be the most common, but input jar is also possible here. Next, you should check the target framework. You are building a Android library and there is a target framework involved. So you have to kind of consider what's going on inside the jar file. Is it using any Android APIs? And if so, what version of Android are those APIs available in? And then choose a framework here appropriately. And finally, click on the build button and the Xamarin tooling will do the work for you. So it takes the input jar file, creates the managed callable wrappers, and then generates a DLL. To consume this in your Xamarin Android app, you just add a reference to the bindings library, to that DLL, and then use the managed callable wrappers. Here I have the course materials. There's a start here document, which has a description of the course, and then links to the three exercises. And, and as always, there's a link here to a PDF copy of the PowerPoint slide. This first exercise is uh, here, bind a jar file. So if you'd like to, please take a few minutes to work through the exercise and then come back when you're done and we'll go over the solution. So our goal in this first exercise is to create a bindings library for this Java code. There's a class called pi, which has inside it a calculate method. This has been built already into a jar file. So in the folder part one resources, there's pi.jar that contains that Java code. So there's sort of two things to do here. First, create a bindings library for that jar file. And second, use the bindings library in a Xamarin Android app. First, let's create the bindings library. In the Android category, under the library setting there, there's the 
a project type we need, Android Java Bindings Library, and I'll just call it Pi. This template comes with a jars folder. And I want to add the pi.jar file to this folder. And then I want to check the build action. And embedded jar, the default in this case, is what I want, so there's nothing to do there. And then I build. Here's the project. And that's the end result of the build. A DLL containing the managed callable wrappers and including embedded inside it the jar file. Next we want to create a Xamarin Android app to use the bindings library. So this time I'm going to create an Android app and then go into the references here. Navigate to the bindings library. If you'd like to you can open up this DLL in the assembly browser and dig down a little bit, you'll eventually find a class called pi with a calculate method. And if you look inside the calculate method, you'll see some J and I. So our goal is just to call that calculate method. And if I run it, you can see I have a result that approximates pi. So our C sharp call here called into our bindings library DLL, which used J and I to invoke the Java code to actually do the calculation. In this part, we created a bindings library for an existing jar file and then used the bindings library in a Xamarin Android app. Next, we're gonna create a binding for an Android archive file. The first two tasks here are very similar to what we did with jar files. We're gonna create a project. We're gonna add the Android archive file to it, set its build action and, and so on. And then we're gonna create an app that consumes the, the DLL that we generated in, in step one. So all that's pretty much the same. There is some new stuff here though, and that is how Android resources are treated. The bindings library actually gives you easy access to the resources like the images and the text files in the underlying Android archive file. Let's just start with a definition. So an Android archive file, this is the library file format for Android. And inside you have uh, compiled Java code and resources. And here we're talking about Android resources. So these are not just regular old Java resources. These are full Android resources, images, uh, strings, and so on. You also have uh, an Android manifest and, and all this is bundled together using the zip file format. To create a bindings library for an Android archive file, you use that same project type. You add your Android archive file to the jars folder and you set its build action. So the basic steps are the same. Create the project, add the file to the jars folder, and then set the build action. The difference here is that the build action is library project zip. When we did this for jar files, we actually had two build actions to choose from, one which embedded the jar and one which left it separate. Here we don't have that option. There's just that one build action and it will embed the Android archive file in the resulting DLL. Here's the consumer. So this is a client app, a Xamarin Android app, that uses the types inside that bindings library. And, and the procedure's the same. You add a reference to the My Bindings DLL here, and then you start using the classes. Uh, these are the managed callable wrappers inside. So access to the types, the classes inside this bindings library is the same as what we experienced for the jar case. The place that bindings for Android archive files differs from bindings for jar files is in resource access. So if you have a uh, Android archive file that has some Android resources, like some images or some, some values folders or some layout files, that kind of stuff, you can actually access those easily in your Xamarin Android client app. And the way that works is that, you know, the bindings library over here on the left has the Android archive file embedded inside it, 
And embedded inside that are the resources and the information about the resources. So there's this r.txt file that contains like the IDs for, for all your underlying resources. And then there's the resource folder containing the resources itself. So all that's available to the Xamarin tooling. When you are building your app, so on the right hand side here, this is a Xamarin Android app. This is the client app that's using the bindings library. The Xamarin tooling is able to reach inside the AAR file and extract all this resource information and merge that into your resource class in your client app. So what that means is, if you have some original Java code, so here at the top, we have our Android archive file, right on the Android Java side, the class is called R, the one that we know on the Xamarin side as resource, and it's gonna have nested class here, drawable, and then some generated IDs. Like in this case, I have an image file called the logo. In my Xamarin Android app, if I look at my resource class, I will see a resource constant with that same name. So again, the Xamarin tooling has done this for us. It's reached inside the DLL, inside the AAR file, extracted this information here, logo, and incorporated it into our resource class, which means in our Xamarin Android app, we access this resource down here just as if it were a local resource directly inside our Xamarin Android app. So here's the case for images. Here's a layout file. It's the same procedure. Here's a layout ID that gets merged into our resource class and we can access it just like we would a regular old layout file directly in our Xamarin Android app. And finally, same thing for a string. Here's a string resource greeting. This is the original Java. If we look at our resource class in our Xamarin Android app, we'll see that, that same ID. There's an exercise to do here if you'd like to. So there's two parts. First, create a bindings library for a provided Android archive file. And then second, create an Android app, a Xamarin Android app that uses the bindings library you just created in the first part. So there is a provided AAR file. This screenshot here shows you what's available inside that AAR file. So first, there's a little bit of Java code. There's a class called info with a method named get phone number. So, so this is sort of the normal thing you have classes that have services inside the AAR file. You want to bind them and then access those services from your uh, Xamarin Android app. So that's going to be very similar to the jar lab that you did earlier. The new interesting stuff is the resource handling. So here is an image right, called logo and there's a strings.xml file with a string called company underscore name. So part of the, the project here is to access that image and that string from your uh, Xamarin Android client app. So please, if you'd like to work through this on your own, pause the video, take a moment to do that, and then come back when you're done and we'll go through the solution. First, I'm gonna create a bindings library for the AAR file. So it's the Android Java bindings library project type again. I'm gonna add the AAR file to the jars folder. And then I'm gonna check its build action. And the default setting there, library project zip is the correct one for AAR files, so nothing to do there. Build and we are done the first part. Our next task is to create an Android app that uses this bindings library. And I'm gonna delete some of this starter code here from the template. So then the first thing we wanna do is add the bindings library as a reference. And then our first task is to access the phone number from the underlying AAR file and display that in our UI. So let's get the phone number here first. And the binding turned the get phone number method in the original Java into a property in the C sharp. We'll talk about that later in the course. So now we have the phone number and our goal is to display that in a text view in our UI. So we'll go over to the main layout file, give it an ID so we can access it from code, and then go over to the code here, look up the text view and load the phone number into it. And if we run the app, we see the phone number displayed in the UI. Our next goal is to display the logo here in the UI. So we'll add an image view and set its source to logo. 
That's the original file name from the Android archive file. And if we run it, we see the image displayed in our UI. And our final task is to display this string here, company name, in a text view. So we add a text view and set the text to company name. Again, that's the string name from the underlying Android archive file. And if we run it, you see the company name displayed in the UI. This section covered how to bind an AAR file. And again, the first part was the same as for a jar file. You create a bindings library, add the archive file, set the build action, and so on. The interesting, the new bit here with the Android archive file was access to the resources. And the key thing there is that the Xamarin tooling merges the resources from the underlying AAR file into your Xamarin Android app, which makes them really easy for you to access in, in your client code. Next, we're gonna talk about dependencies. And there's two big cases. There's dependencies that are for private use, sort of behind the scenes implementation detail. And then there are dependencies for public use where the types are actually exposed to the client. So we're gonna be begin this discussion here with the private case and then in the next section talk about the public case. So we're gonna be binding a file and behind the scenes, it's gonna use another jar file as part of its implementation. Start with the definition. Reference jar means you're trying to bind something here on the left. So this is the normal thing that we've been working with. The thing on the right though is the reference jar. This is used by the library that you're trying to bind. A reference jar must be a jar file. The AAR case isn't supported. In this section, we're gonna talk about what we're calling private use reference jar. And by private use, all I mean is that the jar file over here on the right has a class in it, and you, as part of your implementation over here, you use that class. But you use it behind the scenes. It's an, for you, it's an implementation detail. So maybe you have a private field, or you have a uh, package level, Right? So neither of those two cases, private and package, would be exposed to the clients. So in this case, the jar file on the right and the contact class then would be private use. And by the way, the term private use is something that we're going to actually use in this course, but it's not a official phrase. We just needed a term to distinguish between the two cases, public use and private use. This contact class, it's used only behind the scenes here. It's not visible to your client code, the actual Xamarin Android app that's going to be using your bindings library. Since it's not visible to the client, you don't actually need managed callable wrappers for that contact class. Because this is private use and you don't need bindings for the contact class, there's actually no compile time requirements. So what that means is when you're binding, when you're creating a bindings library for this jar or AAR file here on the left, your bindings library project doesn't have to include this private use reference jar at all. Now, of course, this underlying jar file and the contact class has to be available at runtime. An easy way to make that happen is to actually include the reference jar in your project. So you're building a bindings library here, and on the left-hand side, this jar AAR file, that's the primary thing that you're binding but behind the scenes that uses the services in this other jar file. You should, or you can include this reference jar in your bindings library project, put it in the jars folder, set its build action to embedded reference jar. And this does two things. First, it includes it as part of the DLL, and that makes sure that it'll be available at runtime, which is great. The other thing that it does is does not generate bindings. So the embedded reference jar action, the word reference there means do not generate bindings, do not generate managed callable wrappers for the classes inside this jar file. They're private use only, they're not needed to be exposed to the clients and you do not need wrappers for them. So let's do a quick quiz on this. First question, you are required to include private use reference jars in your bindings library project. So this question really hinges on the word required. And that's false based on what we just discussed. And, and again, the key word here is required. There aren't any compile time requirements for private use reference jars. Now certainly it's true that you might want to include them as part of your bindings library project, but you don't have to. And last question, what does the embedded reference jar build action do? 
So to analyze this, let's start with the word embedded. So since the, the build action includes the word embedded, you know that you're in the first two cases. The word reference indicates do not generate bindings. So together, embedded reference jar leads us to answer B. Embeds the jar in the DLL, but does not generate manage callable wrappers for the types inside. So in this section, we saw how to handle what we're calling a private use reference jar. And again, this is the case where the library that you're trying to bind uses another jar file behind the scenes. It's just an implementation detail. In that case, there aren't any compile time requirements. However, there are, of course, runtime requirements. The archive file that you're binding uses those services. That underlying reference jar has to be available at runtime. So for convenience, it's nice to just include it in your bindings library project and set its build action to embedded reference jar. That will ensure that it's available at runtime. Next, we're gonna talk about public use reference jars. This one actually has two things to deal with because we have compile time and runtime requirements here. Here's the definition. Let's start over here on the right. We have a jar file that has a class in it. So this is the reference jar over here. On the left-hand side, we have the thing that we're binding. And notice that in this case now, we have a class that's public, mail, and it exposes the contact class publicly. So I have a public method here that returns a contact, or I have a protected member that also exposes contact. So in those two cases, public and protected, the contact class is available outside of this jar or AAR file. That's what makes this thing on the right here public use. And by the way, the term public use is something that we coined for the use in this course just to distinguish it from the private case. It's not an official term. The types in the public use reference jar are exposed to the client. And by that I mean when someone's writing a Xamarin Android app and they're using the bindings library for this thing here, this jar AAR file, they have to be able to use the contact class. That means you have to provide managed callable wrappers for the contact class. For public use reference jars, they have to be available at compile time. What I mean there is this thing on the left hand side, this is the thing that we're creating the bindings for. So we have our bindings library project and we've added this thing on the left to our jars folder and set its build action appropriately, either embedded jar, input jar, input library zip, depending on what, whether it's a jar or an AI file and so on. Now, this jar file on the right has to be part of that project somehow. And there's a couple of options for us to get it in there. And this is just to satisfy the compile time requirements. When the Xamarin tooling is generating the bindings for the mail class here, it needs the contact class available. So there's three cases. And really, this just depends on how you decide to provide bindings for that contact class. So in the first case over here, you might have already done that. So let me go back to the last slide for just a moment. So perhaps you already created a bindings library for this jar file on the right-hand side. So you have a DLL, you're ready to go. So that's one case. Another case is you plan on creating a separate bindings library for the reference jar, but you just haven't done it yet. And the final case is you wanna do everything all at once. You wanna create the bindings, the managed callable wrappers for both this left-hand file and this right-hand file all at once, all in the same bindings library project. So those are the three cases. Here's the details of the first one. So again, we're, we're trying to satisfy compile time requirements. So in this first case, we've already created a bindings library for the public use reference jar. So we have a DLL already. In our bindings library project, for the new thing that we're trying to bind, all we have to do is add a assembly reference to the bindings library for the public use reference jar. Here's another case. You're gonna make a bindings library right, for the reference jar, but you just haven't gotten around to it yet. You can create a bindings library project and put both jar files in the project. However, for the reference jar, you set its build action to reference jar. And the reference jar build action does two things. It says, well, it has the word reference in it, so it says, do not create bindings for this thing, which is right. You don't wanna do the bindings here because you plan to create a separate bindings library for this jar file. And second, do not embed 
the jar file in the resulting DLL. And again, that's correct for this case because we plan on creating a separate DLL that has the bindings for this jar. And the final case is, is perhaps the easiest one. You want to just do everything all at once. And in that case, just add all the jar files that you need to the jars folder and set all their build actions. Like in this case, I chose embedded jar. And, and again, this is by far the simplest case. Everything's in the same bindings library. You generate one DLL that has all the managed callable wrappers for all the types. And in this case, all the jar files embedded inside it. Here's a quick quiz on these concepts. First one, you must include public use reference jars in your bindings library project, true or false? And that's true, we're testing the, the compile time requirement thing here. And, and for public use reference jars, there is a compile time requirement. And last question, what does the reference jar build action do? To analyze this, there's sort of two parts. First, this does not have the word embed on it. So you know that you're in the second of the two cases, either C or D. And then it has the word reference included, which means do not generate bindings. So together, that leads us to answer D. So for public use reference jars, it's a little bit more complex than the private use case because there's two sides to this. You have both compile time requirements and runtime requirements. And there's three different ways to satisfy the compile time requirements. And, and really it just hinges on what your plans are for that reference jar. If you wanna create the managed callable wrappers now, or if you wanna do it using uh, uh, its independent bindings library later. This last section looks at the managed callable wrappers that get generated for several of the most common Java language constructs. So this is a bit of a survey. It's not intended to be exhaustive, but it does cover the most common cases. There's a few pieces of motivation here. First one is the languages are actually different. And some things that you can do in Java, you just can't do in C Sharp. And here's an example. Java interfaces can have constants inside them. So you can't map this directly to a C Sharp interface because constants are not allowed there. Some Java patterns like the get set pattern get mapped to C Sharp language features. C Sharp has properties, which is the common and expected pattern when you have getters and setters. And if this were mapped directly from Java to C Sharp, the resulting managed callable wrappers would feel somewhat awkward to C Sharp developers that are used to having properties. And finally, the two languages use different conventions. For example, Java tends to use lowercase first letter for a lot of things, such as method names, whereas C Sharp would use uppercase first letter. So once again, a direct mapping, if, we, if the managed callable wrappers preserved everything in the Java code just the way it is, the resulting C Sharp code would seem awkward or not normal to a C-sharp developer who would be familiar with an uppercase first letter. There's an individual exercise at this point. This is exercise three. And the goal here is to show you a few cases of Java code and let you explore the C-sharp code that gets generated in the managed callable wrappers. We've provided in the part three resources folder, the original Java source, which you don't need to ever look at, a bindings library for that AAR file, again, which you won't need to look at, and finally, an application that uses the bindings library. So this is the one that you would actually look at. So you would open the My App solution here, and this already has a reference to the My Bindings library. So there's a few parts here. In each part, you're given some Java code, and then you're invited to guess what the resulting C Sharp code, the managed callable wrapper, would look like. And to figure out whether or not your guess is correct, you can either go over to the app here, use the assembly browser to dig in to that assembly reference, and you can actually look at the classes that got generated, or you can click on the show answer button here, and the C Sharp, corresponding C Sharp code is included. So if you'd like to take a few minutes and work through this on your own, please do. And then when you're done, please come back and we will work through the solution together. So let's go through the exercise here. The first question is, what's gonna happen with this Java code right here? And really what we're testing here are the different access levels. So we have four different access levels, private, protected, package, and public. 
if we go over to the generated bindings library, here I am in the um, assembly browser looking at the DLL, you can see the public and protected methods in the original had managed callable wrappers generated for them. And those are the ones that are available to the outside world. So the private and package level ones did not have managed callable wrappers generated. In the second one here, we're looking at getter and setter methods. So there's several cases. Let's just do this one first. So there, the Java code has a get width and set width method. So a pair, both a get and a set. If we go look at the C sharp code, there is a property generated named width, and that property has both a get and a set. For the next case here, we just have a get method in the Java code. There's the corresponding C sharp. We have a property generated, which has only a get. And the last case, here we have just a set method in the Java code. In the C sharp, we have a set color method. So for a set only Java, you do not get a property generated. And here's the last case. In this case, we have a Java, some Java code that's doing sort of an event pattern. So we have a listener interface that has a method in it called wait changed. And notice the callback method here, wait changed, takes a double as its parameter. So let's actually stop right there, just with that little bit, and go over to the C sharp and see what happened for that. So because that method took a double, we have this class generated in the C sharp code. We have wait event args, which is a derived class of event args, and it has a property here of type double. This method right here gets mapped to a C sharp event. The binding engine looks for the void return type then either the word set or add followed by something listener, and then a single parameter of the interface type. So if that pattern is met in the Java code, then over in the C-sharp code in this corresponding class, here we have scale, and inside here we have an event. Notice that the original set listener method also had a binding generated for it, but that's redundant. As a C-sharp developer, you would typically prefer to use the event with plus equals right, and a listener method rather than using the traditional Java style. Let's do our quick survey here of Java language constructs and the corresponding C-sharp that gets generated by the bindings engine. Here's the first case. A Java package gets mapped to a C-sharp namespace. Next case, Java classes get mapped to C-sharp classes. Notice the base class of the generated C-sharp. We are wrapping Java classes, and therefore the base class that gets generated here for the C-sharp side is actually Java Lang object. Next, interfaces. So there's sort of two cases. If the Java interface just contains methods, then the corresponding C-sharp is easy. You just have an interface that has those same methods in it. However, if the original Java interface also contains constants, then the generated code is a little bit more complex. Yes, you do get an interface for the methods, but you also get an abstract class to contain the constants. Next, we have instance methods. So in Java, instance methods have virtual dispatch built in by default. So on the left-hand side, that send method, if, if you're looking at that through a C-sharp programmer's point of view, it's like there's a virtual keyword implied on that. So if you look at the C-sharp wrapper that gets generated by the bindings engine, it's not surprising that it will include the virtual keyword. Static methods just get bound straight across. Get set methods are special. In Java, they have the get set pattern, which is fairly well entrenched in, in the community there for what we in C-sharp know as properties. So in the original Java code, if you have either get set methods or just a get, you have properties generated in the C-sharp side. The one case that doesn't happen for is set only methods. So you notice the last example there, set rate, gets mapped to a set rate method and not to a rate property. Java fields get mapped to C-sharp properties. The Java listener pattern gets mapped to C-sharp events. And, and again, there's a naming convention here that, that the binding engine uses to determine when it needs to generate an event. So the return type of those methods there has to be void, followed by add or set as a prefix on the method name, and then have the word listener on the suffix of the method name, and then a single parameter of an interface type. So when all those conditions are satisfied, then the binding engine will generate an event on the C-sharp side, as well as an event args derived class, 
to carry the parameters that get passed to the listener methods. Java actually has two types of nested classes. Here's the first one, static nested classes. So if you look at the left-hand side, you see the word static as part of the class definition for node. This maps directly to C-sharp nested classes. So a Java static nested class is very much like a C-sharp nested class. Java also has something called an inner class. And this is a little bit trickier. So notice first on the left-hand side there, you have iterator. And in the Java code, the word static does not appear in the definition of the iterator class. That's what makes that an inner class in Java. And to actually instantiate one of those iterators in Java, you would need an instance of the outer class. So you would have to say new list, for example, list L equals new list. Then once you had a list instance, you would then be able to create an iterator instance. And so you would say something like iterator I equals L dot new iterator. And that expression L dot new means that the iterator object you create gets an automatic reference back to the list object that was used as part of its creation. So in other words, an, a Java inner class object has a reference built into it that points to an outer class instance. So if you look at the C sharp wrappers for these things, you'll see the C sharp has a nested class called iterator, but it also has a constructor that takes an outer class object as its parameter. And so that is setting up that sort of automatic or, or doing a manual process to set up what we have in Java as that automatic back pointer to an outer class instance. For access levels in the Java code, anything that's public or protected gets bound. Things that are private and package level do not. And, and I think this makes sense. Public and protected things are members that are available to the outside world. So the theme here is the, the bindings engine tries to generate C-sharp code that's going to be convenient and feel normal for a C-sharp developer. So we have things like get and set methods in Java, mapping to C-sharp properties, listener patterns in Java, mapping to C-sharp events. And that brings us to the end of Android 450, building a Java bindings library. Once again, my name is Mark Kapraskis with Xamarin University. Thank you very much for watching.